that is the opportunity right now is making sure to the lowest level to the guy with the wrench in the hand standing in between the beautiful coordinated design and the execution of it occurring that's what we have to bridge and we build spaces that's what we do in this industry whether it's a, a highway whether it's a, a building we build in a specific space and time and what if we begin to organize information in that realm these are the true stories of the shared pains facing designers, builders, inspectors, and operators on our quest to streamline collaboration in the digital age. Find out what happens when industry and technology stop playing nice and start getting real. We are the Construction Progress Coalition. And this is the Shared Pains Podcast. Welcome to the Construction Shared Pains podcast. My name is Sasha Reed, and as your host, it is my role to help all of us gain a new perspective on the systemic changes necessary for design and construction to thrive in the digital age. Today, we will focus our attention on the Common Data Environment, or CDE. Together with our guest perspectives from ClearEdge, Bluebeam, and BIMTRAC, we'll break down the shared pains that occur when trying to maintain a project CDE from virtual design alignment to reality capture verification. But first, let's bring in Nathan Wood to introduce our guest perspectives. Thanks, Sasha. I recently caught up with... Arvayet. I'm a co-founder of BIMTRAC and BIM1. When Carl got together with Jimmy Plant to start BIM1 in 2014, the CDE shared pains that they felt center around large project coordination. We were working on the Quebec CDE report project and uh, we saw a need to create a communication platform to connect different tools together. Issues, clash, requests, uh, you know, all sorts of communication point of view. Um, and uh, we that's how we started developing BIMTRAC. Carl is well known within the international BIM community for his contributions to the IFC standard as well as BCF or building collaboration format. In addition to his new role as a CDX delegate, Carl is also very active with CanBIM here in Canada, building smart uh, Canada as well. So I'm a strong believer of uh, open BIM, open workflows, uh, empowering people with their own data. Next up, please welcome Kelly Cohn here with ClearEdge 3D. Kelly explains his CD shared pains as an architect and BIM manager for Beck, uh, which is where I was at before ClearEdge. When we kind of started down this journey with Verity, it was really to solve a really specific problem that I'd had out on a job site uh, with trying to make sure the work got put in correctly. We spent God knows how many hours on 3D coordination on a really complex job and sure enough, got out there first trade in the field, just kind of did their own thing, blew it all up and lots more time re-coordinating. So it's like, ah, you know, if only there was a way to check the work that people were installing that was time efficient. If verifying the information is half the battle, then the other half is accessibility of information. That's Todd Wynn, VP of Strategy and Partnerships for Bluebeam. It shouldn't take minutes or hours to come up with all the data you need to make a decision. It should take seconds in this day and age. Todd is joined by his voice of reason, Joe Williams, VP of Global Industry Insights for Bluebeam. As you say, Nathan, you know, data as it moves through the process, you know, loses connection to itself. Joe highlights the dilemma we face when trying to maintain project data in a CDE. You know, data gets separated into these silos. As, as it goes on, there's more and more pieces of disparate information. In their time at Rogers O'Brien Construction, Todd and Joe developed a solution to these shared pains called Project Atlas, our passionate child. Before their acquisition by Bluebeam in 2018. Yeah, new additions to uh, the, the Bluebeamer family. We're, we're living the dream, excited to be part of the company now. Before we dive into the discussion, I just want to take a minute to thank our CPC member companies that make this podcast possible, including ClearEdge 3D, Bluebeam, and BIMTRAC. Find out who else is a member and learn more about how to get your company involved in future CDX initiatives by heading to constructionprogress.org slash membership. The process is fairly simple. Digest, debate, decide, and deliver. First, we'll digest the value of connected data across the design, construction, and operation phases before we debate the challenge of delivering the right information to the right person at the right time. Together, we'll understand the role standards and contract incentives play in achieving our vision of a common data environment or digital twin. Let's get our voice of reason, Dan Smilolo, to weigh in. Dan, what is a digital twin? 
but digital twin is starting to be kind of that buzzword in not so much urban planning, but city planning as a whole in the IoT kind of realm where we can start connecting infrastructure, we can start connecting services such as police. You know, you, you see it in like the CSI shows and the 911 shows and all of a sudden they pull up this schematic and 3D view where they're splicing apart the building and you're like, all right, come on. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> not practical. Carl explains why. That digital twin is actually like evolving uh, during the, the, the entire life cycle of that, of that project. To reap the benefits of a digital twin, project data across the life cycle must be reliable and accessible. We've done a great job over the years in the industry of digitizing all this data, but it's still difficult to find the answers we're looking for even in this digital world. So if there were to be a digital twin in the design phase, it would be... The convergence now of 2D and 3D, and that thing is called hypermodeling. There's like different skill sets, right? So people would still continue to use 2D, and some people will continue to use 3D. Digital twin in construction is all about reality capture verification. What we do is we, we try and use all these automation algorithms, computer vision algorithms, to do a first pass. Like I always like to say, our job as a company is to give you a hell of a head start. Um, and so... Those things take a first pass comparing the data. We try and flag anything that looks weird or suspicious or unusual, and you do a quick review. Um, and at that point, you know, it's just a question of, are you updating the as-built because it is where it is and you just got to deal with it? Or is it a serious enough issue to justify a field modification? And then you've got to document that, push it into a workflow management system and make sure the work gets happened, track it through. Which is where we come back to our challenges with reliability and accessibility. Adding data to a 2D PDF shouldn't prevent it from showing up on a map or in a 3D model or whatever. That's what allows that data to, to really be valuable, to move across those those mediums, you know, from one, one form to another. Are we trying to give a different definition to what this it's the same expected outcome is? And are we just calling them different things along the way? It's definitely this digital twin thing is like, I mean, we changed the title from it because it's such a buzzword, but I also want to talk about it. Have we, as an industry, agreed upon a definition of digital twin? No. And I feel like so many conversations go round and round because we don't come to a consensus. So let's jump into the debate portion. What are the real world challenges with maintaining accessible and reliable data across the project life cycle? Let's start with reliability. There's perfectly good reasons and perfectly bad reasons that work gets installed in the wrong place. Um, and just right now, as an industry, we have no workflow or process to, to solve that discrepancy. Kelly says how traditionally. You know, spot checking is, you know, I go out and people are like, oh yeah, we spot check. I was like, really, do you, do you, do you spot check? Or it, did your superintendent get burned on the last job on perimeter steel and all you checked was perimeter steel? What Kelly's hitting on is a psychological phenomenon called anchoring or reference point bias. It seems once again, our shared pains boil down to people. Wide scale uh, quality management is just, it's not a thing in construction because it's never been cost effective, time effective. Owners have never been willing to pay sufficiently to cover the costs that would be necessary to do it at that kind of quality management level. And we're finally getting to the point where the technology is caught up that it's, it can actually be done in the time frame and cost kind of brackets that exist for construction. But to solve it, the traditional process has to be disrupted. You know, once those uh, discrepancies are found, you know, they need to be most of the time reincorporated in the original software in the, in the model itself that's going to be delivered to the owner at the end. With all that wasted effort, somebody's got to pay for it. The capital costs to build a building are a fraction of the costs that a building incurs over its lifetime. A vast majority is in maintenance and operation. And the reality is our industry does a terrible job of providing as-builts, and that costs the owners a ton of money. And so it's it's a matter of time before they realize it's this kind of technology is a mechanism to solve that problem. So as reliability of data becomes more important to the owners, the next step is going to be accessibility. Uh, with the ability to bind both 2D information and 3D, uh, you're kind of removing the barrier to uh, entry for certain stakeholders that will kind of like, um, you know, review those things, uh, those problems that were detected and found uh, on 2D documents. And when it comes to that theoretical 2D, 3D hybrid. Trying to connect the traditional workflows with the new way of doing things. We've not really evolved from one to the other. We've actually been doing both in, in parallel, right? 
ultimately, the accessibility challenge comes down to who the person is, what data they care to see, and how they care to see it. Yeah, I think everybody's got a different, you know, purpose for the data they're creating, and and you know why they why they're creating it, what what their use is for it. Uh, and at the end of the day, people think, you know, I, I, well, you know, I, I don't want to pass, you know, all of my work and and data along to you. Um, I, you know, I'd rather just give you my output, and then you can. You can go from there. I think the common norm that happens almost every other episode is talking about you know data security and what we want to share, what we can share, what we can't share. You know, everyone, whether it's residential, commercial, um, private, public sector, they have their own protocols of what we can and can't not share. We as a vendor who look across from owner to designer to contractor to subcontractor to areas having jurisdiction, we would see the commonality between everyone's process. Um, but each of those individuals felt, especially on the contractor side and the designer side, felt that this was precious to them. These were the things that were really driving their business. And we sat back kind of going, well, not really. So now what I feel like technology's done, because everyone's starting to think about this in terms of data and the data being generated, we're starting to see this. Okay, maybe these processes are more administrative. They're less um, definitive as to how I do things differently. And that's that's exactly where we need to be in order for the, the, the outcome of this to be, okay, we all do this the same. Let's standardize that so we can stop wasting our time and creating confusion for ourselves. Yeah, it feels like the more we uncover these unknown unknowns, the more we realize that we all pretty much do it the same. So when we look at the decide portion of this conversation, it, it appears there's only going to be more technology and tools at our fingertips. So how do we define at the industry level and then decide at the project level the standards that are required? Well, at the industry level, they're already defined, right? Let's start with our design output standard, which is the industry foundation class or IFC. From a design transfer point of view, like converting native geometries from Revit to, let's say, uh, you know, Tecla, uh, they, they've done a pretty good job like uh, rating the IFC and, and displaying the geometries. What Carl is saying is because of IFC, it doesn't matter if you're using Revit, AutoCAD, Tecla, Archicad, and you name it. They can all export to IFC. But, you know, the content of an IFC can change as well, right? Because of something called model view definition or MVD, which allows you to customize the settings, uh, what you want to include in that uh, specific uh, IFC that's intended for a specific purpose. For example, design transfer view versus coordination view. IFC files can pack a ton of data, but the drawback is model files are heavy, right? It's, so it creates delay technical coordination that happens in the in the softwares where people are producing the drawings. And sending those big model files back and forth became a pain, especially when working from a job site trailer with limited internet. The approach we took is trying to detach communications from the models and from the documents. Which led to a new building smart standard called the BIM collaboration format or BCF, which uh, BIM track supports. It's not about the tool itself, it's about the communication channel. How, how is the data flowing between those platforms so that it can be recycled through the entire project? Including reality capture verification. And yes, there's already a standard for that too. Since 2014, the U.S. Institute of Building Documentation, USIBD, has released their Level of Accuracy, LOA guide, to help owners specify their as-built requirements. With more and more purpose-built standards coming out, the challenge now becomes... As a new producer of data, we're trying to figure out, all right, how do we get that data back into the platform? And as soon as you solve one problem, another one pops up. <laughs> and so, you know, for us, it was like, okay, this is fantastic. And everybody's like, great, now we need to get this into insert project information management system, coordination issue tracking system of choice, standards like BCF, so yeah, the last six months of our development have been, you know, BIM 360 Field, BIM Track, Procore, working with BIM Collab, Revisto. I mean, there's all these people we're trying to push integrations out for just to consume the data we're extracting. And that's, you know, that's the point where that data kind of leaves our hands. We're, we don't want to build and yet another data management platform in an industry saturated with them. We have some amazing tools with all this data, but we have to, I mean, I know those words used over and over, democratize, but it's so true. That is the opportunity right now, is making sure to the lowest level, to the guy with the wrench in the hand, 
that is actually standing in between the beautiful coordinated design and the execution of it occurring. That's what we have to bridge. The technology companies are 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 constantly pushing the bounds of what can be done, serving the industry. But when you talk to creating an API where information can speak to each other, that's almost where the technology company becomes disincentivized because now you're taking time and energy and resources to build something that is, for all intents and purposes, creates a level of playing field amongst their competitors. That chaos is going to create a lot of different startups, a lot of different software in this space. I've seen a lot of consolidation in our industry from a software point of view right now, and uh, a lot of new ideas are arising from that to uh, you know embrace the uh, the API integration and um, uh, you know trying to connect uh, some systems together. Speaking to that, Procore has their marketplace. Autodesk at Autodesk University last year had an entire slide dedicated to all of the um, integrations that they're offering. So if we're looking at this, then we're seeing some of the technology leaders in our space are already thinking in this way. But, you know, it's, it's getting to a point where, hey, you know, we, we can do that. I mean, we have the ability yeah. to do that. We just don't. So the thing that I feel so many that are already converted in the industry are seeing this future reality, but we have yet to connect the dots to make the business case for how technology and the business um, operations can jump on board and support this. Well, and the irony in all this and, and why we're in this dilemma is that what what we're, what industry is promoting to technology, as you said, technology doesn't really like, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's disincentivizing the competitive advantage of technology to do what we're asking while we're also talking about our own issues with privacy and data sharing and so it, it really is, it's a, it's a dual chicken and the egg. Okay, Nathan, so, so now let's get down to talking about the deliver part. Um, with all these tools, how do we realistically get them to talk to one another? As you listen to each of the perspectives, each, each one is proclaiming this future that we all know we need to be in, where you understand you know, the, there is a best of breed and that you've got you know, point solutions and platforms and that every project is gonna come, kind of come at it a little bit differently and that you're not gonna win folks over by having all the eggs in your basket. You're gonna win by getting more people to want to put their eggs in your basket. I think too many times we assume that there's one way for everyone and that's not the case if we're going to be the best at our roles. But what brings us together is we build spaces. That's what we do in this industry, whether it's a bridge, whether it's a, a highway, whether it's a, a building. We build in a specific space and time. And what if we begin to organize information in that realm? Whether that data is a design output, a review comment, or a reality capture verification. Well, that, that's what we really discovered in our search for that common denominator was location. Todd and Joe got my head spinning about this idea of a location unifier, that, that location as a way to kind of weave those relationships between the data back together. Really what we have to do a better job of is in the industry is focus on putting the data in the center and then allowing the user to visualize into that data in many different ways, whether it be 3D, 2D, map-based, AR, VR, whatever it is, that visualization is going to evolve based on the task at hand and the user that's doing it. There's not gonna be a platform that does all of that from a document control point of view. It is great to have a single system like Aconex, uh, ProjectWise, uh, you know, BIM360. They're able to provide a common platform for people to exchange information. It's a piece of the puzzle, right? We're, we're not standing here saying that we are the one, one all common data environment. We wanna be a piece in this and this shouldn't be a Bluebeam vision or anyone else. This is a shared industry vision that we all need to push for. And the I think there's an important uh, point to keep in mind here as you're looking at the technology being that tool, evaluating your technology partner is who is API first? Who do you know is already operating the mindset of understanding this is a reality of business? This is the future of businesses. My tools will have to talk to other tools in order for us to maintain the, the customer base that we've acquired. Well, and that's my question is on the industry side, who is the, the individual that understand, you know, our construction technologist, uh, theoretical person that understands what an API is and how it works and the whole business logic of their organization. And because that, that's, I think, this misconception we create when it comes to especially the term like API that's so abstract is we think of it as just like pixie dust that, that makes these things connect together. But the reality is that it's, it's just another tool in another framework that needs the intelligence of what is it supposed to do? What are those rules? What are those requirements? What are those standards that is built around? Bluebeam did not want to reinvent the wheel. There was already a major technology player in the space spending millions of marketing dollars saying PDF is the way to go. This is the portable document format. This will answer your interoperability 
um, challenges for desktop publishing. Here you go. And it was our industry that was struggling to adopt it because it, you know, it, it just, it was a technology that existed, but it wasn't to the level or degree that technical reviewers needed. In desktop publishing, a dotted line, a dash line, a two dash and a dot, two dash and a dot line, as far as Adobe was concerned, was a line. Whereas in our industry, those are very different items. Yep. So the problem we solved was just building upon that foundation and saying, well, let's just standardize and customize it so that whatever's drawn in the CAD program is exactly what you get in the PDF. And so we were lucky in the sense that there was already a technology player spending a lot of money to tell everybody this is the way to go. We just followed suit and standardized it and tailored for tailored it for an industry that needed an additional level of assurity that what they'd created is exactly what they get when they output to PDF. You know, whether it's APIs or IFC exports or PDF or whatever, you know, what what is the data that really matters and and where is that common data environment and and how is that team going to work together to achieve it, knowing that it won't be perfect right off the bat, but they've got the proper quality control measurements based on the, the needs, desires of, of the owner and the different stakeholders. And more importantly, what's going to be the business driver for all of these changes? I think the onus is on us to find what is valuable to the owner and figure out how to deliver that with the technologies we have, put the owners in the rooms as part of the design approval process, and they don't care about real-time rendering but they care about knowing what their design is going to look like and getting feedback at the right time to save them money. And those are the things that differentiate company A from company B from company C when it comes time to win a job. Even on these jobs where you do have these kind of very antagonistic contracts, in our industry, liability comes from unknowns, not from known things. And if you're a GC and your steel sub puts, uh, puts a beam in that's the wrong size, if it's documented, and it gets sent to the engineer for approval because it was caught, you don't have liability. If it's not documented and that steel beam fails, you're the one that gets hit with the risk. And so it's, it's one of those things where it's not about tattletale, it's not about, you know, it's, it's just about documenting. It's about knowing what actually got built to protect yourself. So the burden truly is on industry to be able to come together with the last eight to 10 years they've had to implement technology to really come up with, okay, what data matters to us so that we can then leverage some of those uh, integrations to really get to the state you're talking about today, that CDE or that digital twin. So the curtain wall guys, they see the GC checking this guy's work or that guy's work and they go, wait a minute, I can use that to make sure that all the slab edges are in the right place ahead of time and document it and actually get things prefabricated so my curtain wall fits the first time and nobody's yelling at me over schedule. That's the evolution, right? Like we've seen that movement from paper to digital to data and there's one we haven't even talked about yet and that's automation. And we all know that's coming, that data powered workflow automation is the true Bimtopium workflow world that we want to live in. They've learned enough as the general contractor to determine what good looks like. And now that they've determined what good looks like, they can start to require and build some um, parameters around what that expectation is. That can now be added to the contract. And I think most of us who've been in the industry, specifically in the last 10 to 15 years, um, have been impatient, feeling like we already know what it, what it should look like, but the reality is it just takes projects succeeding, stumbling, hopefully not fail, full of failing, um, yeah. but it takes that in order for us to really understand and articulate what that looks like and then to set the expectation. Um, and what I'm realizing is that it does really come down to that location uh, awareness, that understanding of whether you're a, a line in a drawing or a, an object in BIM or a comment anywhere, you know, that, that relates to anything what is the, the location so that regardless of how you're looking at the data, you know, if, if, if you need to see it, you can see it. I think we've come to the place now where we recognize it needs to be a delicate balance between regulation, consensus, and standardization. So yeah. the regulation is that usually addresses the what's in it for me to a certain degree, but you never want that to come first. Yep. Because we are the experts in our industry. We are the ones who understand the realities. So we as an industry have an opportunity to learn from 
the past and to take initiative to be those driving how we want the best practices to be um, defined, what we deem as best practice based on consensus as much as we can come to consensus on and then informing Congress or informing the lawmakers so that what is then regulated and what the regulators then uh, deem as their guiding principle was informed by those doing the work. And at the point of the data exchanges, we want to be able to have a validation to verify that this information is correct. If there's any lessons learned from industry thus far, it's don't start running down a trail unless you can really start to build consensus along the way. Coming to the understanding of how we submitted an RFI is not our IP. It's not what we're competing on. What is more relevant is how are we leveraging the information that's being created? How are we storing it, recalling it, making it relevant at the right time to the right person in the right format? Exactly. Yeah. What, what do we feel comfortable with? <laughs> and that's, that's a whole different podcast. Yeah. We, we're going to get comfortable with uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's true. I, th I think it's definitely clear, you know, from this discussion that we have, have not uh, fully completed the discussion. You know, there, there are so many owner perspectives and, and other folks that we need to bring in to really resolve this. But I, I think we, we made some good headway on the clarity of those, those three components of the design, you know, production, the, the whole commenting that happens on that design, and then ultimately how that information gets into the field and is verified. And that really is, you know, and, and, and how it's handed over into operations is what makes up a common data environment, the concept of digital twin. This, is, this has been wise on the part of CPC to have the technology vendor as a partner in this conversation. So once you get to that consensus, then it's us, up to us to solve that solve for exactly what you guys have defined. Yep. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to more more folks that see that vision, more projects that want to make that a reality and, and go out and do that storytelling. CPC wishes to thank Kelly, Joe, Todd, and Carl for sharing their perspectives on the solutions to our common data shared pains. On our next episode, we look inward at the strategic investment needed to drive innovation in the design and construction industry, both inside and outside of your company. If you have a shared pains topic or perspective that you think we're missing, we are all ears. Head to constructionprogress.org slash podcast and scroll down to submit your shared pains for a chance to join us on a future episode. Thank you for listening to the Construction Shared Pains podcast. We look forward to joining you here next time.